for that uh, reboot of the system which has allowed us to actually host a bushwalk today. So I just want to say hello and uh, you're welcome from myself, Stefan Winterboer, and from David who's on camera today. And uh, his hands are busy so he can't show you anything. We're heading out now a little bit late but we are going to be heading out towards the other side of quarantine and did I see a leg there or is it just my imagination? Was it a... Anyway, let's go over there and we're going to look like something giraffe-like in the distance. Let's go and have a look. Just looked like caught the corner of my eye at least anyway. So we're going to go and look for a nice place to have a sunset. Today the sunrise or this morning the sunrise was absolutely fantastic. This big red ball in the sky and it sort of heralded a bit of a change in the weather. I know from, uh, from Graham and Emily that in KwaZulu-Natal which is the province which lies just adjacent to where we are. We are in the Mpumalanga province of South Africa. They were in the KwaZulu-Natal province which lies just to the south and to the, just to the south of us actually. And um, it's raining, pouring in actual fact. So that red ball in the sky, that shepherd's warning that we talked about this morning and, uh, and this wind that has just popped up out of the middle of nowhere definitely heralds something coming along. Um, we've all been so busy that no one's checked the weather reports and anyway it was one of those afternoons, careful there Dave, you're going to get treed. And um, it's been one of those afternoons that sort of built up and built up, I'm sure Jamie or Brent has already told you it was like 98 degrees Fahrenheit when we left this, morning, uh, this afternoon which is blistering. Lucky for me I spent most of the afternoon in an air conditioned office which was quite nice. Alright, we've now gotten to the place where I thought I saw the leg and it is nothing which is not surprising I tend to see these things out here all the time so not too much of a worry but in any case it is a nice afternoon it has cooled down somewhat from what it was in the last hour or so and it's actually quite pleasant to give an example of what it is we've, we've, yeah. So Linz, you've asked for some lizards. So first I just want to say hello and yes, uh, we can try and find you some lizards again. Yesterday we found a skink, a variable skink. So I think the best place would be to just head to the nearest wood pile and see what's hunting underneath the leaf litter. Now obviously the, 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 the one that is most obvious is this one that's lying on its side right here. But I don't think I'm going to go there. I think I'm going to go into these wood piles here on the right. The reason for that is that there are a lot of these Birchall starlings and a resident pair of um, the lilac breasted roller that live here and they, a little lizard scurrying across this open area here would be a very tasty morsel for them. So let's stick our noses into some of these wood piles for you Lynn and hopefully we'd be able to find you something here. So the, the first thing that I'm very much like an insect or a spider or even a snake, I react to movement and that is what I'm looking for at the moment. As I'm moving through the bush like this, we get a we're spooking things as we're walking and as I'm spooking it, they're moving. Something that I catch with my eye and can show you. I've only been attacked by a monstrous fly as that came out of the bush there. That was about the only thing that attacked me there. So looking on these branches, nothing much here. You can see that this is a very, very thorny tree. But while we look for your lizard, Lynn, I think a good idea would be to go and send you off to James in his tent with all those exciting things. Right, we're in the tent still obviously, but what we want to show you is what's going on at the dam cam. There are some elephants over there and we'll switch across to that feed. There we are, a small herd of elephants feeding in what is, a, I think this is a great vantage point because what it shows you of course is the dryness. Virtual starting there flying through the bottom of your screen. You see that Eggsy? Yes. Well done. Now. Uh, all you can see is very slight bits of green and that green is almost exclusively Guarebush or Euclidea divinorum and of course Brent started off telling you that nothing likes to eat that stuff and he's absolutely correct of course the giraffe being forced to eat it that greenery in the top right hand side of your corner of your let me go again with that. That greenery on the top what was on the top right hand side of your screen was a jackalberry tree and that elephant there now 
in amongst the Gwari bushes, but you can see very much trying to avoid them, trying to get at the last shoots underneath the fallen knob thorn. And the skeletons of trees all around there that you can see. Now the Zumi, of course, is in control of the camera, doing a very sterling job indeed. And the wobbling, of course, brought about by this wind blowing in strangely from the northeast. And I must just corroborate what Brent Leo Smith was saying about La Nina. Um, I have just done some research because I hadn't heard what he had heard. And it would indicate that La Nina is likely to be a very weak one this year if we're going to have it at all. So that's quite interesting. So far from the predictions of deluge that uh, have been, well, sort of bandied about the place here, it would seem that we'll probably have a pretty average rainfall year. That's absolutely fine. We'd be very happy to have that indeed. On that note, let's head across to Brent. Wait a second. He's got a road. I am indeed on a road, but this is where the lions crossed out of our traverse area this morning. But there were no cub tracks. And uh, so they found them adults sleeping there. So I'm going to go have a quick look around a Buffalo's Hook waterhole. Maybe we'll find some little lion cubs. Well, Buffalo's Hook waterhole is. Hang on. Hang on, hang on. Right, we're live, we're echoing. It's like a sports car in here. Okay. This is what I'm going to show you. Here we are. <laughs> here. <laughs> we weren't quite ready for that, everybody. We were trying to capture an insect outside when suddenly we went live. This is from a buffalo's foreleg. And what's interesting here is that the buffalo's foreleg, of course, is much the same as your forearm. Uh, well, but like mine, really. There we are. Okay. <laughs> and this is the humerus. So that would be the equivalent here of where your bicep sits. So the bicep would be on top there and the tricep at the back. And then, as we turn around, this is the elbow joint. And this piece of sort of, well, it's bone, it's a bony spur, is actually the elbow. And who knew that a buffalo had an elbow? And that's what that is. Now, you know that if you feel on your forearm, so just go to your forearm, not you, Eggsy, you're on camera, uh, you, and just feel along there, and you can feel that there are two bones there. One of them is called the radius, and one of them is called the ulna. And I remember which is which by remembering the, if I'm not mistaken, the ulna is the smaller one, and it goes towards your smaller finger, so it's on the outside, and the radius is on the inside and goes towards your big thumb. That's how I remember it anyway. So here, you can see that this buffalo has got both as well. Radius and ulna, and I th I'm not actually sure which is which, but you can see they're semi-fused. There's the gap there. Radius and ulna, almost fused into one. Okay, now, um, if we go over here, Egbert, from an entirely different animal, oh, I don't think that we should spend any longer with me fosking around with these diseased bones. Much rather, let us go to the lions of the Unkahuma. So before we were rudely interrupted by the heat, I said I didn't see any cub tracks crossing, so I was going to come look for the cubs. Brian just went, lion, and there they are. It looks like one of the lionesses has come back. I can't, I can count one, two, three. Oh, look at that, so cute. That's amazing. Lion cubs make us mushy, mushy, mushy creatures, especially these little encormas. But let's get a bit closer. So I did see one adult lioness there as well. Hey guys, I haven't seen you in about 10 days or so. So lovely. Now, of course, couldn't find them this morning, but it doesn't matter because we found them tonight. Oh, and the light is about to get quite 
spectacular. So I have heard that there are some missing cubs. So fingers crossed that there are more than six today. I see one, two, three, four, five. Six, I think six. There were two missing. Look, we've got, we've got six here. So, unfortunately, it seems like two are still missing. Oh, hello, guys. Beautiful light, beautiful lions. Oh, we do love ourselves, the Inkahumas. So that a couple of degrees it's dropped in the last while has obviously prompted a bit of movement. So it looks like the rest of the pride are not here yet. So it's just one female and the cubs. see she's still quite hot she's panting heavily I think she must have arrived in the last five or six minutes or so so I think our timing was impeccable being clever like the animals sitting in the shade with the elephants for an hour or two and then it's just you know wander around time for the predators to get moving I wonder if any of the other lionesses might come join. So I know a lot of you are still quite upset that there are only six cubs, but that is life out here in the bush. It's not to say that those other two might not appear. I'm going to say that the longer it goes, the more unlikely it is, though. Ooh. Now they're trying to sneak in. Oh, she's hot. She's hungry. So it looks like they didn't have a successful hunt last night. There's the youngest cub, the young, two of the youngest cubs. So if you're hearing that click, click, it's me taking a picture, and I suggest you do the same. Get some screenshots of these beautiful little lion cubs. They're going to come right in front of us. You can see they don't really mind us at all. Let's see what happens. Hello, little ones. Now, Chai Town Connie is wondering, is there any chance the missing cubs might return? 
there is always a chance. And I'd love to be proved wrong, but the longer we don't see those little guys fall, the less likely uh, an imminent return is. It's dangerous out here in the bush. There's hyenas, and of course, other lions, snakes, eagles might even take a small cub. Comes the last one. Now she's about, I think she might head towards the Juma waterhole, to be honest. That lioness is moving into the bush, opposite direction. to where the rest of the pride are. Might be taking the cubs for a drink. Careful, madam, lots of eddies around there. There's that wonderful noise. Ow! her through the bush. We're going to do the same. I'm going to try to keep up with them. And the last two are about to pair in the bottom left of screen. There we go. I'm so excited we found them. Great spotting, Brian. Okay, we're going to keep up with them. And while we move, we're going to go see how Jamie's doing. Well, Brent keeps up with the little lion cubs, and it is marvellous news that he managed to find them. Although, I have to say, I'm a little bit sad to hear that it is still only six of the little ones. So, obviously, the missing two have not yet been found by the adults. In the meantime, we started off our sunset safari talking about a herd of buffalo. I'm actually going to stop here. Where are these buffalo? They can't be that quiet. Apparently, They've just crossed Voyatilla Bay in access over the last sort of while we were in Arethusa. I'm trying to figure out exactly where they are. So while the search for the buffalo continues, let's go across to James, who's having a look at the Juma Dam and an elephant. Look at this, everybody, at the dam cam, a wonderful sight. Hello? Have you got our audio? Back to the dam cam. Have you got me now, Kirsten? There we are. Right, so what we had there, I don't know if you managed to see it, the tiny little one there, the youngest member of the half-trunk herd, that's our favourite elephant herd here, was having a whale of a time swimming in the water there. Elephants love to swim, but of course this little pan, look at him! This little pan, much too... Oh, he's going to have another swim. <laughs> this pan is too small for the others one. The others, <laughs> excuse me, to swim in. You might find that they'd lie down in it for a little while, but at the moment they're just having a bit of a drink while the little one, uh, exactly as a little child might, is swimming around there. Now also on the far left hand side of your picture you will see Ronald the rover. Ronald is not working at the moment, he was working until earlier and he has ceased to work, I, we think, on account of the heat. But because of the elephants there, we're not going to go down there and do anything about him until later. Look at this little thing having a swim. Zumi, you are completely on fire here, moving entirely in time with my voice. And what you'll find is a great deal of affection there from the rest of the herd. They enjoy the sort of playfulness of these youngsters and in much the same way that we enjoy the playfulness of human being babies. Look at it, it's having the best time ever cooling down, mud, water, something to drink, mum's close by, so's my big brother. 
And there's Mum just looking at something. She spotted something. See, she's opened her ears out, standing between whatever it is and the elephant herd. I wonder if there aren't some impala to the left-hand side, Mr. Zumi. Oh, is there something on the left-hand side there, maybe? See her looking like that. And elephants way in the distance. Hello, Ellen in Arkansas. You're wondering, we've just seen that little elephant uh, swimming. I wonder if they're not a little bit alarmed by Ronald there. <laughs> I think they are. Uh, you want to know if it's born during a drought, how quickly will an elephant adapt to swimming? Well, I, th I think very quickly indeed. You know, I mean, that elephant is probably a year old or so. And while it's been born during some pretty dry times, it's certainly seen water in Bifelzog Dam, so enough for it to have swum in. It's seen water here. It would have seen water probably in Arethusa Dam. I think they've been in both dams, this half-trunk herd, and all of the dams in Bifelzog. So although it's a drought, it has seen water before. And also, I think, you know, unlike human beings, which have to be taught for seemingly a appalling amount of time how to swim. Uh, young elephants and young dogs, as you I mean anybody who's owned a dog before knows, you put them in water and they just know how to swim. And I think it's very much the same for that elephant. Blacksmith plover on the right there, well, no, back to the elephant there, having a wonderful swim. Look at that. It's not even deep enough for him. Hello, D you're David, you're in the UK and you're our Zoomie. I think you're doing an absolutely spectacular job. So thank you very much for your dedication and for the skill with which you're operating that camera at the moment. Mercifully not me doing it. I'm hopeless at it. Just can't get out. You can see he feels like maybe he should get out. Perhaps Mum said that's enough, but he's not getting out. Yeah, Mum is reacting to some Impala and I think also the smell of that rover. I think she's unfamiliar with it. And so it's quite a good thing that it's not moving. It's quite a good thing that it's just sitting there and they can get used to it as a totally harmless part of the environment. But see how they've formed a protective ring around the little one as it obliviously swims in the water there. I think that is just too sweet. And I've no doubt that Mum would love to have a swim too, but it's just a bit shallow in here for her. And there's a slightly younger one tossing mud on top of his body drinking a little bit and the <laughs> little one how they don't get stood on I just don't understand I find it so amazing look at that, that is ridic absolutely ridiculous enjoying the feeling of the mud and the scrape of the rocks and now the older one's getting in on the act someone's going to try and push this one into the water just like two kids would they're two young bulls that is wonderful. And the one on the far side there, I think the one on the far side is actually part of this herd. And I don't think that the closest one to us, the young bull closest to us is actually. I think he may have joined from that other herd. That was the other side of the dam there. It's interesting because there are five of them now, you see, normally just the four. And I thought it was her, the half-trunk cow, young matriarch. And I thought the one at the far side there, who I think is a cow, and then this other youngster who was about to be tossed into the water. Does everyone agree with me there, or am I wrong? Yeah, I think that's right. Look at that little one, it's just it's too excited, it's too excited by the cool. Th it can feel the cool of the day starting to come now. It's not quite so hot, it knows it's going to go into a cooler time, enjoying the swim, the safety of mum. A gorgeous light, lots to drink, and of course an elephant like that, just the same as a child of the same sort of age. No idea about the stresses and strains of trying to find enough to eat. Look at that other... <laughs> Paul, you say the half-trunk daughter has taken out the nest cam, and it might take out the rover next. I couldn't agree with you more. The nest cam, uh, not to put too fine a point on it, seems to have... Uh, will come apart somewhat. And the daughter, the, oh, there we go, bigger one's now in. Bigger one now in the water. Couldn't deal with not being, having a swim. This is fantastic. This is, I haven't seen elephants swimming for goodness knows how long. And now they've obviously decided 
that there's enough water for them to have a bit of a swim in. And look, it's almost like the half drunk cow is slightly too nervous to come in. Almost like she's saying, <laughs> why are you playing there? And apparently there is a hippo in the top left corner looking morosely on as his last remaining piece of habitat is monopolized by these five glorious elephants. On the far right of your screen, look at that thing scratching himself on the logs there. All of them lying down on the cool mud to cool their bellies. And look at the half, the half trunk cow splashing the one in the water there. Look at that. And with her ears out in a very unthreatening way. You see how her ears are out? or well, they have been out, but her head isn't lifted. So she's obviously communicating in some way with the little one in the water. And there is the, well, that's a Transvaal saffron bush, but there's the hippo looking very morose indeed, thinking about making his way here. They look so ungainly and they look so miserable at this time of the year. <laughs> What a wonderful, wonderful sighting that has been to sit here and observe. Let's head back to Bifflesook Dam and the little cubs. So she's moved a little bit and she's laid down again now. And uh, quite a bit of growling at the cubs. So I think she doesn't have that much milk. She's quite hungry. Tired kitties. I'm just trying to see if we can find a better spot. It is a bit of a difficult area. Let's yeah, see what happens. Just to the right, Brian. Look at that little one on his back. Okay, the action here. There you go. Uh -huh. so, oh, there we go. He's flopped down now, but he's rolling around. Now, lions will often lie with their belly exposed like that, so the white helps them to cool down. Okay, while stuff calms down here, let's go back to Steph, who's on foot with a little ho ho. Now I am with a little assassin bug. Have a look at this beautiful specimen here. So I know he's an assassin bug because of his long streamlined shape. The way that he's holding his front antennae, these are these two leg-like arms here in front. And also, if you have a look underneath his head, you will notice a black, almost recurved dagger. Now that is his proboscis, and this assassin bug waits and walks around, looking and imitating a stick, waiting until an insect triggers a strike by touching one of these two antennae, they then lunge forward and extend that black pipe that you see under his head. It comes out like a switchblade, basically unfurling, so going from this to opening up and stabbing down into an insect, usually at the back of the head or just into the thorax, and then they, using the same weapon, they suck out all the juices. Can you imagine anything more terrifying than that? This branch coming alive next to you, it'll be the same as this tree we're going to have a look at in a moment, coming alive next to you, grabbing you by the body and then sticking a drain pipe in the back of your skull and sucking you out. Not the nicest thing. Assassin bugs. Isn't that the coolest little guy? And he's tiny. No bigger than my finger. Front end of my finger. 
Isn't that just the best thing? But we have got another surprise here for you as well. And that is the long away Relief guide. So when Herbert goes on leave, we have Rexon Intimani who comes and helps out. Rexon is the newest game ranger, the newest guide for Juma Private Game Reserve. And many of you will be going, but you recognize him, and it's exactly because Rexon used to guide for us for Wild Earth many, many years ago. How many years ago now, Rexon? About, yeah, six, seven years back. Six or seven years ago was when he's left. He's been looking after his family since then. You're going to be seeing a lot more of Rexon, not only on Juma's game vehicles when Aubrey and Taxon go on leave, but also with us on the walk, keeping us nice and safe for when Herbert goes on leave as well. So welcome. Nice yes. to have you aboard, man. Yeah, lovely. All Happy. right. <laughs> Rex has been keeping us safe for a few days now, I must be honest with you, we've been a bit naughty and not letting you know, but we thought we'd keep it for a surprise today, and uh, I'm very glad that we got to do that. And on that note, so while we walk around and find something else amazing, let's cross over to James in his tent. Right, I would now like to take the largest photograph in history, everyone, so if you could all smile on the count of three. Look at my finger. You got it? One, two, three. You all look wonderful. Well done. Now, we're going to the dam camera. Very nice. There we have the hippopotamus. I don't know why he got out. Well, I do know why he got out, actually, because he got out because, uh, well, because uh, Connor and uh, Alex and I went down to try and put the rover down, so he left. And then while he was gone, he was uh, sort of usurped, if you like, by elephants. Here he comes. Oh, isn't he amazing? So ponderous and slow. They look like they're from another world to me, hippos. Look at the strange feet, soft four toes, enormous muzzle. And they look like they could not move. Oh, he's having a drink too. He's so thirsty. They look like they couldn't move faster than you and I could possibly crawl. But they are not slow. And he also looks like, with that great big mouth of his, he could probably drink most of this pan in four or five gulps. I think this is just wonderful. Now, if you look carefully, you'll just see the odd head bopping up above the surface of the water. That is a terrapin, a serrated hinged terrapin. There on the right-hand side of your screen, you can see one popping up. It's gone back down now. Oh, this is wonderful. And now he's going to lie down. And you can almost feel the weight disappearing off his little legs. And oh, you now he's just taking a load off and breathing easy. Ah. <laughs> I think that's so cool. All right, I don't think he's going to do a whole lot over there. Uh, over there, Eggsy, you can see the sun is beginning its descent over the western horizon. While it does that, let's head across to Jamie Patterson and find out what she has to update you about. I'm afraid to say I don't have much in the way of updates. It's just that the buffalo herd has been managing to avoid me this entire time. Aha! got some tracks on the road of these buffalo. Now the question is which direction have they gone in? I'm really really hoping that we get to see them all make their way towards Sydney's dam and they go and have a drink as the afternoon starts to get a little bit cooler. They're wandering along slowly but surely crossing. You've got two options. They could go to one-eyed pan on Simbambili, which obviously we can't go that... Oh, I think that decision is relatively clear. Sorry, we'll have a look at this. All, they all decided to cross here. Just in case you were ever wondering how game paths were made. You can see relatively smooth road on either side, or at least ahead of where we're stopping. And then a whole load of buffalo tracks moving to the north. Right, straight towards Sydney's dam. Lots and lots of them. Okay, so that's where the main group crossed. 
Now, I'm not going to jump out to show you too clearly just because I want to try and catch them as the sun starts to go down and before they disappear into Buffel's Hook. Hopefully we should encounter them somewhere here on Sandy Patch. Now, we've already paid one quick visit to Sydney's Dam and there were a couple of elephants that went dashing away over the dam wall. While I catch up with our buffalo, let's go across and look at one of the other magical tiny things with Steph. Have a look at this spider that's made her web in the footprint of an impala that is inside some elephant dung. And you can see this little spider. I'm not exactly sure what spider this is. I think it's a type of wolf spider. However, it is beyond me at this point to tell you what spider this is, but they are quite common out here. They almost always build their webs across a depression, and from the depression they build a little tunnel, and she's sitting at the entrance to a tunnel. But this is giving us a very, very good look at what these spiders look like, because usually they're very vigilant, and as soon as you come close to them, they dart back into their tunnels and you can't actually see them. So this is actually giving us a, it's giving me a beautiful chance of, or a good chance of seeing her. They've got quite a raised abdomen. That I have noticed on these spiders before. I don't quite know what they hunt. I have, as a youngster, thrown crickets into these webs, thinking that they would, that they would rush out and grab the cricket, but they don't. So they hunt something else. And I'm still not sure exactly what it is. I've never found the discarded remnants of any of her prey species, but you can see there on her head, she's got this raised sort of serrato her uh, 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 cephalothorax, the, 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 the piece that's just where her eyes and her head are, is raised slightly. I don't know if Dave can see it. Let's get a better view. Let me get out of the way. So that you can get a better view of her face. Have a look at that. She's got lovely colours on her. Stripy legs. Okay, I'm just going to point her out quickly. Let me see. So in front of the leaf, against the background there. So there we go. It's a bit shaky. She is tiny, this spider. But there you go. Beautiful. Well done, Dave. And there, for those of you who like the spiders along with me, definitely the web is a giveaway. A flat web on the ground over a depression with a tunnel on the one side. That is exactly what the giveaway to this little spider is. And now, what's equally amazing is that she's moved into this particular home after an impala has walked across an elephant dung, leaving an impression there, or a depression there. But have a look at this elephant dung. This elephant dung is almost completely used up. This is what happens after a few weeks of drought and termites and wind. This is what's left of a piece of elephant dung. It's just the sticks, really. All the fibrousy material has been used up. And isn't this just a wonderful way of looking at the way termites bring fresh, nutritious ground above the soil and take all the nutrients to feed the poor soil back down with them? But anyway, on that note, back to Jamie with those buffalo. We have just finally caught up with the tail end of the herd and unfortunately they're playing hard to get still in some very dense vegetation. They, you can, you'll be able to just, wait let me go forward a little bit, you'll be able to just see that one cow through the gap and they are definitely on their way towards Sydney's dam. I'm going to have a late afternoon drink. I can only see six here and there are definitely tracks of more. So they're probably on their way. Ouch, mosquito. They're definitely, this might just be the straggling group, but they're definitely on their way towards Sydney's Dam. Which for us means as long as we play the patience game relatively well, we have a good chance of seeing one of those truly iconic scenes. African buffalo herd in the dust as the sun starts to go down. That's what I'm anticipating at least. For now, though, they are in some very, very dense vegetation. It's the block between Sandy Patch and Voyatella Main Access. It's one of Shadow's favourite places, just by the way. 
We haven't seen Shadow in a little while, not since she was mating with Tingana. Right. Now this is what's been fluttering. Try and keep it still. Fluttering around our faces and our eyes over the last few the last few hours. This is a little Mapani bee. Yes. Oh wait, there he goes. Yeah, little Mapani bee. Awesome, how cool is that? And they're after the moisture in our sweat and in our tear ducts and around our eyes, which is why they like to be in there in our eyes and our ears. And they make the most sublime honey. Apparently it is some of the best honey in the world. I have never tasted it before. Here you go. Oh. Now trying to duck underneath, I even tried there underneath my fingernail to see whether it could find any moisture. Okay, while I attempt to escape the fluttering Mopani bees, goodbye. Let's go back to James and see what's happening at Boyatella Dam. Wonderful stuff that. I'm just eating a bit of a snack here. Delicious termite mound. Um, that is the same kind of bee, of course, as living in the giraffe skull. Now, as I've told many of you before, um, I know people who eat this termite mound as a delicacy. I think it's pretty much inedible, to be honest. Uh, let's go and have a look at the dam cam. There we go. Now, we've got a lot of elephants there. Excuse me. <laughs> and what they're doing is harassing this hippopotamus. And one of them, the biggest one on the left-hand side, was the other side of the dam, and he was flinging water at the hippo, and the hippo got up and looked like it might come out. But you can see them communicating with the hippo, uh, not in a language I suppose he understands, but in the same way that if you say to somebody, if you're a South African, for example, and you go to um, uh, you go to Brazil and you say footsec to them, they will know exactly what you mean. It means go away. And those elephants are saying the equivalent of footsec to that uh, hippopotamus, and he is not budging. He says, I've been out for long enough. You lot go away and leave me alone. I'm very, I've had a hot day. I've had nothing to eat. I've had nothing to drink, and I've been burning in a hot sun. So you leave me alone. And that's what he said to them verbatim. There. In between the elephants now, you can see the nest cam. The nest cam, well, perilously close to destruction at this stage. The power has been pulled out already, and I'm sure Connor and Alex are watching this with a sense of great dread. And this scene, this kind of scene that's playing out here at the dam cam, I think you're going to find continues pretty much for the rest of the dry season and I think it's there's going to be tremendous action as long as this pan remains pumped oh look at the little thing there having a snooze on the ground that's so sweet now I mean I must say the skill of the zoomy here is impressive because he doesn't have a big picture view of this he's got exactly the same view of this that we have there, there is Ronald Ronald get moving useless individual he won't move, you see, he's just he's recalcitrantly stuck there in the mud, possibly afraid of all the antelope around him. The impala are coming in to have a drink, there are doves coming in to have a drink, there's all sorts of things coming in to have a drink. Let's go back to Brent and those little golden tawny bundles of joy. So Mama took us on, on quite the goose chase through the block, but we managed to keep up with her. And she's now come back out to the road. No, try Everyone's you can eat stopped it. for a little bit. We still have my audio, everybody. Shall we sing a song, Jerry? <laughs> come and have something to eat, Kayla. Uh, it's sorry. delicious. So mm. Let's move a little bit mm. closer. Yeah. Yeah. I was yum, worried that I had to keep moving, so I just kept my distance in case we had to keep moving again. <laughs> Magic.
complaining. Mom, I'm thirsty. I'm hungry. Hi, Monique, who's in London. Now, Monique says, is it common to have one lioness looking after all the cubs? It is, because remember, they're aloe suckle, so they're aloe care as well. So all female members of the pride will take care of cubs at some point, and if they are suckling, uh, then they will allow the other female's cubs to suckle as well. Oh. She's quite hungry, so she probably isn't producing that much milk. So that's why she keeps getting up and moving. So once the cubs have suckled for a little bit, she gets a bit irritated, probably gets a bit painful as well as they try to knead um, her nipples to try to produce more milk, or they start biting a bit hard. And that often causes her to get up and walk, which is what's been happening throughout since we've actually found them. Ooh, excuse me. Lots of dust in the air at the moment. The one's lying quite close to us. One of those slightly older cubs snoozing down. They're all getting stuck in to that lioness. Now, lion cubs are weaned at about six months old. That's when their mothers will stop producing milk. But it isn't unusual for a lion cub to suckle older than six months if there's another lactating lioness in the pride. So, well, we sit with these incredible Incahumas. Jamie's got an animal that probably, re or actually not probably, really doesn't want to bump into Incahumas when they're hungry. I think that is absolutely the case with this herd of buffalo that have finally decided to emerge out into the open. Now one thing we're going to do as they make their way towards us is if they start to move in front of the vehicle, we're going to do a VR segment. So I'm going to be talking to you, but essentially I'm going to be talking to the VR as well. And here we go. Everybody ready? We ready, Vim? Cool. I don't want to clap and scare the buffalo. Right, so here we are on a hot afternoon here in the African bush and we've got a whole herd of buffalo approaching us off to the right of us, making their way towards one of the remaining water holes. And as you can see, if you have a look around, they're going to come around through the, across the front of the vehicle, so keep your eye out as well. But as they make their way, just have a look around you and you'll see that there's absolutely no grass in this vicinity and that's because we're currently in a very, very serious drought here in South Africa. And buffalo herds, like the one that we're seeing here, don't usually stop and feed on trees. But if you watch them as they move through, there's a very good chance that they're going to be eating the, buff the trees that are here as well. Here they come, streaming in front of us. There must be about 30, 40 odd buffalo, so quite a small herd a big old cow right in front of us and here they come the sound of the buffalo as they move through it's not a quiet thing a buffalo herd we can just hear their feet trudging across the road and across the soil as they make their way towards the dam a couple of little ones in there you might have spotted but mostly adult females, just like the one that's walking at the back of the group. 
and they're still looking in really good condition. They're going to make their way straight across towards the waterhole and they're all going to gather there for a drink. Beautiful time of evening. It's been very, very hot this afternoon. It's been 37 degrees. They've had a hot afternoon and now as it starts to get a little bit cooler, as the sun starts to go down, they're going to move through and have a drink and quench their thirst. Another gorgeous afternoon here in Africa. Okay, so that clap there at the end was to sync up the VR, all of the different GoPros, because obviously we have to combine them. <laughs> <laughs> well, our buffalo move through and across towards the dam. Let's go across to Bushwalk. You've got a beautiful view of what I imagine is going to be a stunning sunset. It is indeed a very stunning sunset. Have a look at that. Just the sun disappearing slowly behind the thicket of terminalias in the distance. Not quite as red as this morning, nonetheless, this golden yellow ball through the trees there. It's not often that we show you a sunset through the trees like this. Quite often we've got an, a more open view. We're standing on the edge of a what we call a flay in Afrikaans or a seep line in English. And those terminalias along the back there are just ringing the edge of this just beautiful area. Sun setting, doves cooing. We've had a few. We've had a few of these green pigeons racing past us as we've been standing over here, all going to the tall trees on quarantine open area to spend the night there, and we're still walking into the sunset. It's going to be a fantastic afternoon. Temperature has cooled down a lot now. It's a much more comfortable day now than it was when we set out a little bit earlier on. I must be honest with you, it was breaking hot this afternoon. But we've managed to weather it and our out here still and it's just, it's a good afternoon. All right. But without further ado, I'm going to say goodbye for now and send you over to Brent with those lines. I'll follow them. I think you must get to the dam wall and then just turn left and you'll be able to so I've just heard the rest of the pride apparently are moving south. They're still quite a way away, but who knows, maybe in the next half an hour, the other four lionesses and the big male will join them. <laughs> Swat. Swatted by a tail. Look at those little eyes. Okay. Oh, she's up. Yeah, I don't think she's... She's on the move. Now, I know a lot of you are wondering about the missing cubs. As we've said, it is normal. That is what happens in the African bush. Uh, if all the lion cubs survived, it'd be really tough for all the buffaloes and impalas. So, as it's about a 70% mortality rate that uh, lion cubs face in this part of the world. And there's always a chance that those cubs might be found, they might be fine. And, the longest I've seen cubs lost from a pride for is about, oof, about a week, week and a half. Uh, they were skinny, but they were okay. But as I say, the longer we don't see them, the less likely they are to survive. But who knows, maybe Brian's thumb magic will work today and we'll happily see them rejoin with the other missing cubs. Wow. 
very common line behavior. Walk, lie down, walk, lie down. And before the other cabs get close, and to walk to join her. I'm going to move around so we can get a, a view of them coming down the road to see her. Isn't this absolutely wonderful? So, while we get around to the other side, let's go quickly across to Jamie, who's got something having a sundowner. Our buffalo have finally made it to Sydney's dam, and well, without any further hesitation they've all gone streaming right into the water getting past the muddy edge and gathering to drink and what is interesting about the way that the buffalo have approached the water is they show far less hesitation no, charming and don't just much like our hippo from earlier don't have too much of a problem in terms of toilet plus drink in the same place oh what I was going to say is that they don't show the same degree of hesitation that the other animals do when they run in to go and drink. And that may well be because they generally aren't too bothered by crocodiles. Just imagine how big the crocodile would have to be that would manage to catch and drag down a buffalo. It is possible, but in this area it would be very, very unusual. They don't have to worry too much, except, unless for they are buffalo calves, and even then they've got the huge herds surrounding them. So the crocodile would have to pick out which one they chose very, very carefully. Of course, there's the famous tale of the battle at Kruger, which I think everybody knows, which was that incredible tug-of-war between the lions, the buffalo calf, and the crocodile. Eventually, the buffalo calf managed to escape the attentions of both the lions and the crocodile, but after an what could only be described as one of the most extraordinary sightings. And there we go, not lingering for too long. They feel a little bit exposed here. And I think probably relishing the drop in temperature that we've experienced this evening. The sun has started to go down and it's definitely much, much cooler here. Still double checking, bunching together as a herd and making sure that they don't go wandering into any danger. The hardy dars have just taken off and can't see them from where we are, but we can definitely hear them. Lovely. And off they go. We're going to carry on and see what else we can find for the last half an hour or so of the... Oh, there's our stragglers. <laughs> Lovely. Okay, well, while they make their way towards the water, we're going to carry on and see what else we can find. In the meantime, I think Steph has got a little bored and is apparently, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but he's playing with sticks. Let's go and see what he's up to. I am indeed playing with sticks. I'm going to tell you why now. For years, and I'm literally talking about 10 years, I have been trying to make a fire by rubbing sticks together. And I've decided that today it's dry enough and hot enough and windy enough to try and do something with my fire sticks. Now this is a piece of blackjack and as you can see I can get smoke. You can see the smoke there. I'm going to add some fibers from a piece of zebra. Look at that, my stick smoking. I have it. It is so difficult. I can get smoke. I've never, ever, ever made a fire. And so what you got to try and do, you got to try and get a coal going from, from rubbing, from friction. And as you can see, much smoke. Now issuing from it. And what I'm going to try and do is get a little coal to fall out in that gap that I have there. Oh, I need to take this off. Hold on. My binoculars are getting in the way. I'm going to try and get a coal to form in the hole. And then onto that piece of elephant dunk. Whoops. It's 
so hot on your hands. Yes, we can see smoke. I'm almost there. Whew, it's hard work. I've watched a little Bushman friend of mine do this literally in 20 seconds. Here we go. Come on. You need an exceptionally dry area to do this. Come on. This is busy. Turning my fingers into sausages. Come on, you can do it. Let's see. No. No little ember yet. Ugh. I've got to keep on practicing. And I've ruined my hole. You can see there. My hands are oh, blisters, blisters, blisters. You can see lots of practice still needing over here. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so much for that try today. We live to try again another day. And on that note, off to those little cubs. So one of the little cubs has come right next to us. Wait for him to turn his, oh, I can't see if it's a he or she at the moment, but wait for it to turn its eyes. And we're gonna show you something quite special. Come on, turn your head. Come on, look this way. Well, they're all focused and listening to where there was a, or well, the lioness in particular is focusing on where there was a Franklin came flying out of the bush, alarm calling just to check if there was anything there. Oh, he's turned his head behind. Now, hopefully we've still got enough light. But if you look carefully, oh no, don't close your eyes. In the reflection of his eyes, you could actually see us sitting in the car, but now, <laughs> of course, uh, Murphy's Law is not playing along. Darlene in San Francisco, one of the most beautiful cities in the world, is wondering, is it too hot for lions to hunt at the moment? When do they usually hunt? Now, Darlene, uh, they're opportunists. As long as the hunt's not too long, they can hunt in the heat, but generally they prefer to hunt when it's cooler. So any time from now is a good time to hunt. I think the rest of the pride are on their way to join this lot. There we go, hello little one. They are up, there we go. Oh, just for half a second. And yeah, the Franklin's alarm calling. All these wonderful sounds, his head so busy. Listening, smelling, sounds, smells, sights. Oh, yes, I think she's running low on milk. Now, the other lionesses are on their way. Hopefully, they're a bit better resourced than she is fully stocked. I think they're still quite far away, but I will keep an ear to the radio. Hopefully, they do arrive before the end of the sunset safari. Oh, but she's up on the move and moving away from where they're coming from. Let's just see where she goes. right next to us. Hi, girlie. She's contact calling. Now, there is a possibility she is calling for the missing cubs. Or for the rest of the pride. It's impossible to tell. Or calling for these cubs to follow her. Oh, 
And as she turns to look back, I think that's the most likely. And this lot have just started to make a noise. Now, she's laying down directly behind the car, so the cubs are going to pass right next to us now. Here comes one, and they're going to go so close that they can see Brian. Brian, what are you doing? Look at it. Oh, maybe they can see the cub thumb. They think one, one of their friends might be on the vehicle. I mean, they're about two feet, less than two feet from the, the tire of the car. No, it's too tired to carry on. I think the way it's here. Okay, here comes the next one. Is he going to make it all the way? Is he going to get lazy and lie with its cousin? We actually um, cannot move the car. I've just realized as I look behind me, there's a lion cub lying right behind us. Yeah, so we are, we are stuck here for the moment. Now, uh, I think, there we go. There's the one lying right next to us, behind us. So while we wait for the lions to move off so we can move, uh, let's go see what James is up to in the tent. Let's straight across to the microscope feed, everybody. Check this out. This is a little jumping spider of an astonishing array of honey, gold, and copper colors. And look at him, he's tiny. Now what he is, he's sitting on the brown tablecloth, an extremely cheap piece of fabric that we have here. But it's very finely woven, as you can see, and I just wanted to put him on this to show you the scale of this little fellow. He's about mm, maybe five millimeters long. You can't even express that in imperial... Um, sort of imperial uh, measurements. Look how tiny he is compared to the... He looks like he's sitting on a fairly large sort of um, uh, sisal mat, but he isn't. It's pure cotton and... Well, it's not pure cotton. It's largely synthetic polyester, but you get my drift. And what you can see there are his eyes on the top of his head. He's got one, two, three, four, five, six sets of eyes, and indeed probably eight. As If I'm not mistaken, they've got eight eyes. There's another set just in that sort of bald patch it looks a bit like Steph and I he's obviously a bit old he's, uh, he's starting to bald on top there uh, but there's some light sensing eyes on the top there isn't he amazing and let's just go back to his to his abdomen there let's focus down his abdomen you can see his little petty palps there on his head moving look at that they're cleaning his cleaning his little fangs and his little mouth and I'll show you what we found him in just now. I struggled for a long time to make him sit still, everybody. I, such is my skill at wrangling a five millimeter spider. And look at the hairs. Those hairs, very sensitive, very good at feeling the air and feeling the prey that he's trying to get hold of. They're not just there for decoration, salon quality though they may be. Isn't that cool? I think that's an amazing, amazing picture. And I'll just quickly show you what we found him in. He was living in this, the gall. I'm just going to put the microscope down. The gall of what is often referred to as the gall of a gall moth, at least not a moth, a gall wasp, that's found in, on a, a silver cluster leaf tree. But there's no wasp in here. And I don't know what this is. But look at all that incredible, incredible silk. And from it, or inside it, a whole lot of prey species, whatever lived in here uh, with that spider, m 
killed quite a lot of beetles in the interim of its life. OK, let's head across to Steph. He seems to have a tree and hopefully some success with his fire. Welcome back and just have a look at what we found. This is such a rare treasure to see. For those of you who think that this is a rock, you're 100% right. What's your aerial? Um, you're 100% right. But what this is also, it's a millstone. Can you believe it? A millstone for na native corn and wheat. So women used to gather around these millstones and with a round river rock, used to throw some corn or millet into this stone and then grind it. And over time, you get this lovely dished shape coming out of the rock. Now, I've read histories of why these millstones were broken. You can see that this millstone was broken. It looked like it's been hit with something. And the reason for that is King Shaka Zulu of the Zulu Kingdom chased a cousin, I think of his, called him Zilakazi, through this area in about 1920 to about 1940, somewhere around there. I can't remember the exact dates. And as the impis, his warriors, moved through this area, they broke the millstones when they found them so that the people would come away from their hiding places and have to join his army because they were starving, they couldn't make food. And so this could come from that time. And it's just so exciting to see little, little bits in, of ancient history that come through here. So millstone, this was the base. A corn or, or, or the, the grains would be put here and then using a river rock, they would then grind the, 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 the grains and the crushed maize would fall out the sides and it would be collected in baskets. And then this very clear break through the middle of this millstone is just so indicative of the time between 1820 and 1840 when the impis of King Shaka would come through here and break these millstones to force the people into subjectivity basically, into vassalage almost. Very, very cool. Anyway, that's us from the walk for today. So I just want to say thank you very much for joining us today. We're going to see you tomorrow again. So from myself and Dave and Rexon, I want to say have a good night. See you all soon. And for our last a few moments of our sunset safari, we've got one of the little antelope species that we hardly ever get to see. This is Brent's favorite, and I have to say it's one of mine as well little female bushbuck. They are just so incredibly beautiful. The same sort of colour as a female Nyala, but with less obvious striping along the side, so the white stripes are not as clear as they are as an Ana Nyala, and they've got far more white dots on them. And they're much, much smaller than a Nyala, but basically part of the same family, the spiral horned tribe of antelope. Isn't she gorgeous? And they love these dense drainage line areas where they can hide away. Very shy antelope, although they do habituate and get used to people very, very quickly. And we don't actually get to see bushbuck that often, except around our camp. Liam, are your bushbuck still living outside your room? Yeah, he's there sometimes. Still there sometimes. There was a little pregnant female that gave birth. Oh, where are you going? Off she dashes and decided she's done being hidden behind the trees and off she goes. Lovely. Oh, it seems as though we have reached the end of our sunset safari. So from myself and Viam, a big uh, let's go to the lions over to Brent. The, the missing cubs, the missing cubs have arrived. There they are. Isn't this wonderful? Brian's magic thumb! Yay! <laughs> uh, just keep coming down. Um, the two missing cubs have just joined the rest of the pride, so all eight now. There we go! <laughs> Looking a bit skinny, but they are here! They've survived! Isn't oh, this amazing? Killer bees! Killer bees! Oh, Brian's magic thumb! <laughs> <laughs> yes! 
<laughs> We've been talking about it all afternoon. Wouldn't it be amazing if the cubs arrived? I think she's calling for them, but I'm not sure. Then she suddenly just got up and ran behind the vehicle. Happiness. No. <laughs> I'm happy to see you, but not that happy. <laughs> so I think the rest of the lionesses are coming in from the north, and she's she's found the missing cubs now. She's heading back to the pride. We're going to stick with them, but um, I'm sure everyone is absolutely ecstatic. I, as I said, I was hoping, I was hoping, hoping, hoping. Uh, but so we still got eight little wonderful inkahumas. I'm sure there's two very hungry little kahumas. They looked a bit skinny, but none the worse for the wear. So they've survived how many days now? Five, six? Yeah. Five, six days on their own. Vernon, they're starting to head uh, back north towards the dam. This is so incredible. I'm so happy. Now all highly mobile. And female is on a mission. Obviously, she doesn't have much milk to give, so she probably wants to meet up with the rest of the car, uh, the pride. There we go. That's one of them. Look how skinny, skinny little one. <laughs> Isn't this awesome? Ow. Ow. To you too, missing one. I think there's a good chance. There we go, she's calling. Look at this, they're going to meet up with the rest of the pride. Let's stick with them. Hopefully they don't take us to too much thick... Uh, go into too much... I can't even speak, I'm so excited. Too much thick bush. But it looks like we might get an incredible greeting ceremony. The whole pride rejoining with those two missing cubs. Please don't go that way. That way is very bad for us. I'm hoping she gets on the big elephant path that goes straight north to the Buffalo Hook waterhole. Isn't this incredible? Vernon, Vernon. Okay. Vernon, are you at Buffalo's Hook? Yeah, I'm family. Copy, yeah. I'm going to come join you there. The rest of the pride are running towards there now. Okay, sorry, my earpiece came out. Brian had to whisper. I got too excited. I pulled it out. So we're going to shoot up ahead to where the other two lionesses are out in the open. And uh, we'll try to stick with them, we'll see. Uh, hi, Sarah. Sarah says we've just made her year. So, guys, I think just for the greeting ceremony, I know there's only supposed to be three minutes left, but I think we can extend a little to see this. Isn't this amazing? So look at this. We're nearly at the other line. There's only two of them, so probably the two mothers. And the cubs are running. So let's try get ahead so we can hear everything and, and get to the spot where those other lions are. Isn't this absolutely incredible? Here come the cubs. We've just got ahead of them. So they've managed to survive five days by themselves. They got separated for the pride. So this is the first time all eight cubs have been together in about a week. We can't see the other lionesses yet. On the other side of the dam, Brian's got them. So here come the mob.
Isn't this just too special? There we go. We, I can see one lioness on the other side of the dam. There we go. Just spotted, it's just spotted the other lioness. Look at this, off they tear. And the two of them have been lost for the last week. They've been by themselves in the bush. Okay, let's just roll forward a little bit. So everyone out at home is apparently crying with happiness. I'm very happy. There we go. Look at that. Magic. And Kahuma's reunited. And as Kirsten just said to me, what a perfect ending to the day. We could not have asked for a more magic, magic, magic moment. Brian and I have literally been hoping and wishing for it all afternoon. And if those of you who followed the thumb will notice the thumb said, maybe his lion cub thumb will bring back the missing two cubs. And it has. There we go. One can't help but feel all warm and fuzzy. So it is getting dark and as you know we don't put spotlights on the cubs. The mothers are reunited with their babies. This has been an absolutely spectacular sunset safari live. The killer bees are cooing. <laughs> But uh, from Brian and myself, and of course, we cannot forget the lion cub thumb. So here it comes, the lion cub thumb that brought the luck. Uh, we're going to say good night and absolutely amazing. We'll see you tomorrow morning, but quickly one last view of that incredible Kahuma pride.